supply chain uh, in, the, in, in the whole process. So now, we'll, um, hopefully that's giving you some kind of how this thing is gonna go forward. So now, our value of supply chain manager is both COVID uh, responses. So this is where the whole premise of why we are here today is that what is supply chain is gonna look like after uh, you know, COVID, uh, uh, COVID-19. It's a fact of the matter is now that everybody now knows that okay, when is that, so that we can prevent the next pandemic, but to make sure that our supply chain, whatever it is, either linear, logic, or hybrid, is wire tight. And that cannot happen without, that cannot happen without us kind of tightening the screws on what we managed as risk within supply chain uh, premise. So, and a lot is that as time goes on, our job as supply chain is going to change over time. I believe uh, in the next five to 10 years, the, the world supply chain manager is going to be more reevaluated and go into the fact of people start looking at us as value chain managers, because what we're going to be providing organization is not about, it's going to span beyond what we can provide as dollar that, you know, cost optimization, a dollar and cent or whatnot. It's going to be how much value we can provide an organization. And if we look at risk from a value perspective, rather than cost perspective, I think life is going to be better. And that's one of the reasons why we have issues across the globe, because everything is all about cost optimization. Everything. So even all these black markets, people selling masks and PPE, is all about money. But if we look at the value proposition as part of the baseline as which we operate as with risk and look at the network of supply chain and what it has become, I think we can get some great alignment and we can actually sync this and make it work. So as we look at ourselves as managers, we are not, our job after COVID-19 is way beyond supply, managing supply chain up and downstream is about how do we provide value to the organization? Because now we have to look at how do we provide access? What kind of suppliers, the supplier development, procurement? I mean, you'd be surprised that a lot of things are going to be bundled upon you that you don't even have no scope of it before because now a lot to be required of you to bring value to the table. So that's what I see. I mean, I've, and I've seen a lot of things happening, all right, from a lot of webinars that I've been to, supply chain managers are now expected to know everything, to be able to provide value in such a way and in such a manner that has never been done before in the history of the profession. So now I move up to what, what risk, uh, what is risk as it pertains to supply chain? So as I spoke earlier about the way we view risk it has to be the same as the way we view our supply chain now. Uh, risk as it pertains to supply chain, as Mr. Bearden said earlier, is that risk has to have the two phase of it. You know, there's the opportunity side of it and there is this parasite side of it. But we've always seen risk as parasite. I think the society and the way uh, things are shaped up, we always look at risk as being parasite. But down, down this presentation, we're gonna look at different opportunities that are therein. As in the process of doing risk management, we can see a lot of opportunities that can just pop up and we can explore that can bring more value to the organization. But as it stands right now, we're gonna explore this risk parasite uh, from it and how it pertains to it now. Risk is a parasite that resides in every process. It's not only supply chain, every business process, every process there is on earth, there is risk involved in it. But why is the supply chain risk so important? And why is it so that it's, if it is not properly taken care of, we have issues with it. So okay, with this idea, I mean, this actually boils down from a lot of research work that has been done in the, on the military side as risk is a function of the threat, the vulnerability and the consequences. And that's what we've been, that's a linear form of looking at risk. And this is, this is the classic form of looking at risk, is threat, vulnerability, and consequence, a function of all of them acting together. And ability to kind of decipher risk has to fall within those three parameters. And if we cannot do that, then uh, we are misaligning our risk, the way we, def do we define risk with the rest of the world. Now, if we are operating on a linear logic, this will fit perfectly. But now that the supply chain has been morphed to something else, this particular definition doesn't necessarily feel uh, what logic is all about. I think from and some of the things that I do is that the way the supply chain is moving as a value-driven concept, the risk is going to be seen as uncertainty and exposed to uncertainty. Those are the two entities, from my perspective, that was going to be seen the risk at, in a parasitic kind of form. That risk is out to either either uncertainty or exposed to uncertainty. And that is how you view risk. Whatever is uncertain, 
risk is present. Whenever you're exposed to uncertainty, risk is present. And that's pretty much it. Because everything else after that is really getting more complicated. But looking at it, the function of threat and uh, vulnerability and consequence, those are linear and it's still applicable in this world because our, our network supply chain is based on also on the linear logic and all these things can actually be interwoven if we actually take time to look at it. So if we still continue to look at risk from threat, vulnerability and consequences, it's fine, but we have to evolve to see, uh, to see it as anything that is that breeds uncertainty or some kind of eventuality that you never, you cannot predict or you never actually have any scope of, of it, then that risk is therein or anything that can expose your task, your process to anything of any level of uncertainty is risk. So if we look at it that way, and as we kind of venture into embracing globalization and the world of uncertainty, as we know, the more our supply chain embraces globalization, the more uncertainty we have. So as we continue to embrace globalization, our risk propensity is extremely high. Now brings me to what is your supply chain risk culture? Uh, what we've seen over at least 15 companies that have dealt with since the onset of uh, COVID-19 is the fact of the matter is a lot of supply chains out there do not have a risk appetite or risk culture rather. Most times when you go to different organizations, people are like, so who is in charge of this? People are like, that's not my lane. Who is in charge of this? That is not my lane. Who is in charge of making risk decisions? Oh, I don't know. It's not me. That's what I know. I'm not going to pay for this. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be responsible for this. That kind of uh, negative attitude towards risk as what has kind of plagued a lot of supply chains. And as time goes on, as COVID, uh, COVID happens, the most of this thing has to be raised for us to have full grasp of our risk management within our supply chain. We have to establish a risk culture and this has to be blessed off by the management. The management has to set the tone of kind of risk appetite, risk consciousness within the organization. Risk, I mean, from my perspective and the way I grew up, everybody is a risk manager. If you're in the supply chain, everybody from the guy that, from the guy that drives the forklift all the way to the CPO within the risk within the supply chain uh, spectrum, all of them are risk managers. Though risk, whoever makes risk decision differs, but everyone within that, within that spectrum has the right to make like something risky is going on over here. I need to report it if the person cannot make that decision. But we have to look into our organization. Have we, look, have we look into our organization and find out what kind of risk culture is there in? Are we actually embracing risk or are we actually dissecting risk? Are we, how are we, encouraging people to, to be able to face risk and encourage the ability to report risk as well. Because this is where everything is going on about you know, our risk propensity. How do, we, how do we welcome risk or how do we antagonize risk? Uh, a lot of organization that are now sharing these are building as well, that a lot of this thing that we've seen in the past is the fact that a lot of people can actually foresee this risk, kind of pivot in a way embrace it, prepare for it, mitigate it. And that's why they've been able to succeed. But in an event whereby you don't even welcome anything that is of negative, or you don't even do risk rehearsals, or you don't even encourage people to speak about something risky, then how in the world are you expected to manage risk within your supply chain? And these are the things that is gonna be expected of us after COVID-19, because a lot of managers are gonna be pivoted. Of course, a lot of people have predicted that, oh, our sources of supply is gonna move primarily for you know, all our, you know, tier, different tiers of suppliers are going to move away from China. But looking at some of the stats I saw yesterday is the fact that, at least in America, a lot of these guys are not even, they're not even thinking of moving their supply chain away from China first. They're talking about cost optimization, which tells you that this particular event of pandemic hasn't changed much. But one of the things is going to change is how much risk affects dollars and cents. And we cannot actually articulate that unless we address what is our risk culture. Now, I'll further go on into difference between linear supply chain, uh, network supply chain, and hybrid supply chain. This is where I, I, I grew up a little bit, and you can chime in as you say. This is where every one of us grew up in, in supply chain management. If you ever studied and have done any certification uh, in supply chain, this is where everything is based on. The current curriculum of every supply chain body of knowledge is based on linear supply chain. This started since the since the fall of what, um, since the end of uh, World War II when everyone's talk about this supply chain and how it's so awesome, how supply chain actually helped uh, to defeat 
uh, you know, Nazi army in, in World War II and how he actually helped during the, during the fight in the Pacific as well. So this has been the bread and butter of it. And this is what we've all talked about, whereby we can, our, there's no universality or supply chain. Everything is within the confines of a country. Every, you know, you can, you can see the beginning from the end. You can see the end from the beginning. This is linear. Everything is linear shape. Demand is driven. You know, raw materials, logistics, you know, manufacturer, distributor, retailer, back to consumer and whatnot. This is the basic form linear that we all grew up with. And everything else, you know, demand forecasting and every other thing that all these other new jazz that came out of it was catered towards these rigs uh, during the supply chain. About 30 years ago, then people started shifting. Ah, we really don't need to, you know, we need, we need cheaper stuff. And most of these advanced economies are now tending towards service economy. So there's no need of manufacturing. They move manufacturing to South, Southeast Asia. And with that, you've kind of stretched the supply chain from what is nationally known to be more globalized. And in the process, there's so much other actors, other stakeholders therein. And more importantly, normally, the general rule of thumb is whenever the longer your supply chain is, the more risk it becomes and the more expensive it is. But this particular one presents a different method. Like, look, we can, even as long as across the globe in China, you can still get it cheaper. And that's what makes it more attractive for a lot of manufacturing companies, including the giants, Fortune 500, they all went over there to make uh, to make money, and which they did, but now becomes an issue. Our supply chain has morphed. People, small, small uh, mom and pop stores cannot really actually operate within the confines of what is linear. So everyone is now kind of have something we call hybrid. You don't have the full potential to have a full blown network supply chain, then you have something of hybrid. A little bit of linear, a little bit of uh, network supply chain. Now, what is network supply chain? Network supply chain is what was birthed when we started stretching our supply chain across the, across the world, when we started having different kind of stuff from uh, supply chain visibility, supply chain risk management, supply chain resiliency. We're talking about uh, all kinds of stuff going on over there, data driven. Now, the same network is being called now, a lot of people actually do refer to it as digital supply chain, where everything is all digitalized. You know, we've before ERP is actually the, 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 the bridge between the linear and now digital. Now ERP is becoming an old legacy uh, platform as well. Now everybody's now moving into different cloud system. Everybody has their own independent stuff. There's no need of so much backbone again. Not too many of the backbone is needed to actually actualize an enterprise no more. So there's all kind of craziness is going on. Depending on whatever works for your organization, everybody jumps on it and make it work. So the issue of the network supply chain, which I have some graphical depiction over here, is that everything is all, I mean, it's more or less of an ecosystem. You have everybody working interconnected. Before, in the linear supply chain, I don't really, I can't really access my consumer. The consumer data is given to the distributor or the retailer. But now, uh, a, a supplier can actually do, go directly to the consumer and get the, the data that is needed because everything is all interconnected with all these advanced technologies. We have artificial intelligence in the, in the we have blockchains. We have, uh, you know, Internet of Things and all these other new wave of technology, RFID. They've made uh, data accessibility. I mean, I, I mean, everyone is pretty much accessible. I don't need to go through all these intermediaries to get all this information that I need. I can go directly to start. And we've seen the giant retailer like Walmart. You know, immediately you pick an item from Walmart store, immediately registered to the people that are producing it. That one particular item as is reduced, as somebody already picked up in their headquarters, and they can actually you know, forecasts, you know, replenishment and whatnot. So at this particular point in time, supply chain has really has been morphed to something different. It wanted a network supply chain whereby you have so many actors in there, so many players, so many stakeholders, you know, from, you know, you have your data guys, you have your cloud service being hosted in Mumbai. You have your engineers working out of uh, Bangladesh. You have, so anything that happens at any given time within your network can actually shut down your network. Very interestingly enough, a hard trick in Mumbai might actually disrupt your own network because that is where your cloud is being hosted, you know, or something happens to your engineers in Bangladesh, you know, kind of. Apply. So anything within that realm of the, the scope of the ecosystem can affect each other. Mr. Bernard and I talk about the issue of ecosystem and how we kind of use, we can use that, that biological definition of ecosystem and the way the network supply chain, there's a lot of similarities in there. And if you want to find answers to some of the issues plaguing the network supply chain, we can actually find it from nature. It's very fascinating and quite interesting. That's, a, that's beyond the scope of this uh, discussion, but 
we can discuss it offline on this. So now, so difference between, talk about difference between linear and supply chain. There's, there's a poll that's supposed to be going out. Uh, I want you uh, to look at what you, uh, what you think of what linear supply chain is and what you talk about network supply chain and what comes to your, what comes to, what comes to mind. I know one is more dynamic, one is more said, one is more slower than the other, one is more real time, all those kind of things. So whatever your experience has been in managing supply chain and what you think the difference is, it would be awesome to, uh, to see those. And I think the, the, the polls has been displayed. You guys can just fill it. I just, it's only two questions. Uh, you know, what comes to mind? And I can tell you each of them, I mean, linear has, is very sequential in nature. You can't just go directly. You have to bounce from, it's like bounce from one to the other. And it's very delayed action, you know, because all these bull whip, the old bull whip effect came out of linear, linear thinking. The old bull whip, you know, the elasticity in demand and supply came out of that uh, linear uh, knowledge. And they're very static in nature uh, because it's not as dynamic as the, the, the use of digital and very centralized because it's only it's one way in one way out i can know the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning mostly in country yes the demand variation and whatnot and then if you go to uh if you go to the one in supply chain very dynamic in nature actually the process and digital workflows are very uh, is amazingly fast very interconnected very decentralized so, right uh so um the the poll has been launched <laughs> um so i would i would like that uh, we all respond to it um you know maybe like in a minute uh, i'll give like uh, one minute for everyone to 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 be able to respond okay. i just two questions so it wouldn't take your time at all awesome i re really appreciate it so from what you know uh and what you have uh what you have experienced as supply chain managers just tell us what's the difference between the two and then, then we have, of course, I've spoken about the hybrid. Hybrid is just the kind of commingling of both. And it's always a pro very problematic because oftentimes what is linear and what is, uh, what is network is completely different. And to be honest with you, the idea called supply chain is the linear logic, period. Mm -hmm. It's just the supply chain itself. The name supply chain is very, very linear. But now that we've evolved into more network supply, and I think that's probably the quite appropriate word to be used for it. And this is where the bone of contention of how we view risk and how everything that happens to our supply chain, this is, I believe from my own experience and what I've done in consulting, this is where everything emanates from. The fact of the matter is a lot of supply chain professionals cannot differentiate between the two. The fact of the matter is that they cannot define the two because it's oftentimes when you inherit a problem within your supply chain is the fact that, okay, what are you, because when you, when you start a position as a supplier, you have to be able to triage your system. Am I network supply chain or am I linear? You need to know from fact because every other thing will fall in line. If you're linear, fine, continue with the linear or you can find a way to transition to network. And if you're network, stay network. You know, what are the, because you cannot have linear network and then everything that is supporting you is, uh, is net, uh, you cannot have linear network and everything that's supporting you is, uh, is network. It's going to have media supply chain rather and everything that's supporting this network. So it can be very, very uh, tasking and daunting sometimes and very frustrating because oftentimes you see people working 18, 20 hours. Something easily can be, I mean, and all this can be fixed because the, there's a clear separation between what is linear and what is network. So now we'll move on to supply chain risks mitigating strategies. And this is what we, you've seen this, uh, you've seen these strategies that I'm going to go with you, but we got to look at it differently. We have to look at it differently. It's a classic way of assessing risk, not only in supply chain, but everywhere we go. Uh, I mean, in, in project management, in, in any other disciplines, even within a church or a mosque or a synagogue, they always assess risk the same thing. But in the middle of supply chain, depending on what kind of supply chain you run, you have to look at it differently. And the way things are going, most supply chains in the world are now networked. Because you cannot most, I mean, even small and pop star, you know, uh, all these small, they're not even getting their supply chain from their local vendors. No, everything is all globalized. They're, everybody wants something cheaper. So we can, it's safe to say that most of our supply chain should have evolved to network, uh, uh, network supply these days. So now one of the mitigating strategies is identifying the risk. And one of the things I talk about is supply chain mapping. I've, I've, I talk about this a lot. And it is the, I, I'm telling you, man, this is one of the most kept secret, not only in supply chain, but in supply chain risk management. And if you can get the concept of supply chain risk mapping, or even let's forget it, let's talk about even, 
because risk mapping is different from supply chain mapping in the cell. And oftentimes when I go to organizations and I ask for people, okay, where's your supply chain mapping? People that have never managed your CPU have never mapped their supply chain. Some, even for the lack of better words, some don't even know that it was being supported from China during this COVID-19. It's very interesting. I found out about three different companies, very big companies that they have major products in the US, never knew that some of their suppliers are coming from China. It's quite interesting that if you are the CPO and you don't have a clue where those, some of those products are coming from to service whatever you're doing in your organization, it makes you wonder like, what else do you know? So supply chain risk mapping or supply chain mapping itself, it gives you an overlay of everything within your supply chain. Who is who? Who is working where? Who is supporting what? Different routes within your supply chain. Though it's as simple as said, but it's quite complex and very expensive. Very, very expensive, actually, when it comes to the risk aspect of it. And some of the things are in identifying the risks is that when you do your supply chain mapping, you map everything out. Like this, exactly, this is where everything that has to do with my supply chain is who, where, and all you answered all the five Ws, everything is out. And then you have to, we have to understand the known risks that plague your supply chain. You overlay your own known risk over those mapping. It gives you kind of a clearer picture of what could happen. It gives you your critical path or your critical items because there are different items that organizations that support different organizations are critical items that are very critical. Critical items are items that regardless of whatever is happening in your supply chain, you must have these items. If not, your company or your organization is gonna stop. And then you have other items that support it. Those ones are they're, they're great to have but they're not showstoppers. Now, in, in supply chain risk mapping, you have to understand that the myth is that your critical item must be protected and every risk associated with your critical items must be identified and must be mitigated. You can, there's no way in the world you can mitigate every risk within your supply chain. There's no way, I mean, absolutely. It's completely expensive and it's irrelevant. But what you have to do is that you have to look at what are the critical items, critical items that if I don't monitor this risk within my supply chain, my whole supply chain is going to crumble. And that's what you have to focus on. You have to be able to identify different risks. And once you do the overlay, which ones are low risk, which ones are medium risk, high risk, and which ones are critical high risk. Normally, the high risk one is going to be agitated with your critical items or critical tasks within your supply chain. Now, the very interesting thing uh, Mr. Abiodo and I have been talking about is the use of social network analysis. Which is uh, it's been it's been in academia for a while. People have been talking about it, about the social network, and this is this is even quite interesting. It's a way of actually mapping your supply chain and mapping your risk within your organization, and it's about identifying, look at relationships, look at the social relationships within every stakeholders within your organization. And I have an example over here. There's a uh, there's some software that does all this supplier buyer, what kind of different connections over there. Now what? Social network analysis does is that it helps you kind of identify the framework, what you're looking at, who is connected with who. If anything happens, let's for example, you have one that is going on in Mumbai and how can Mumbai that I have nothing going on over there affects my supply chain. They definitely, that will actually reveal out to you. But most importantly is the fact that you'll be able to identify what are the centers of gravity. The centers of gravity is that if I pull this node these vulnerability nodes are what's going to happen to my supply chain. Then you also, I mentioned vulnerability nodes, we have to articulate where are my single parts of failures, where are my vulnerability nodes within my network supply chain, I'm able to identify it. And more importantly, is also to look at the influencers, who are the influencers within the social network and how can they be identified and how can they be profit. Now, this is where the opportunities of risk comes in. Oftentimes when you do this kind of social networking, you see different risks both on the parasite side and also the opportunity side, like, wow, this particular stuff, and I was explaining yesterday, let's say you have two, when you do your social analysis, you, the one you're using, uh, social network analysis, the one you're using is out of, uh, is out of, uh, out of China, and you've been, they've, they've been very good, but with all this situation going on in China, you have to look at, wow, there's one in actually in Angola, uh, you look at, you know, ah, the framework is bad. They don't have supply chain framework within the organization. But if I actually, if I actually help them kind of morph and help them with their processes, their product is even better than the one I'm getting in China. And I can actually increase my market share if I can call this for. So you have to be able to make those kind of analysis like this is an opportunity here. And I can, if I can develop this developer, if I can develop this supplier, I might be able to gain or access more market share within, within my industry. And those are the opportunities that kind of pop out when you do social network analysis. Uh, this is just a, one example of you. There's 
I mean, there's algorithms that we call it social graphs and all kind of stuff that kind of mutate everything out. You know who is acting with who. Uh, it gives you, it's very, very clear. You know where you cannot mess with, you know where you can actually store with and how, if anything's gonna happen in your supply chain, you can actually anticipate it. Now, we'll go off into, you know, assessing, uh, you know, assess the risks and determine the critical center of gravity and influences. Okay, that's, that's what I just mentioned using the thing over there. Now, develop controls and matrix. This actually, we've been discussing with uh, Mr. Abiodun this week about stress testing. Uh, when you develop controls and make risk decisions. So as you, as you kind of overlays your, your network out there, you create different nodes, you know the vulnerability, you gotta stress test it. Oftentimes the most ideal thing is to do what is called uh, just a normal rehearsal, rehearsal like if this thing happens in real world out of China, how does it affect the all different nodes? within my uh, network supply chain. But ideally, you cannot simulate pandemic. Ideally, you cannot trigger like, you know what? Let me let me just put COVID, let me just put coronavirus somewhere here and see how this is gonna affect my supply chain. Oftentimes, it's not ideal, but what you can do is to simulate it and stress it. Like, if this happened, you can kind of do a simulation and modeling. If this happened, if there is a COVID, there's a virus that strike this major supplier within my node, how does it affect my supply chain? How does it, I mean, how far reaching can this be? And this is necessary. Oftentimes we come up with all these bright ideas of how to manage risk, how to manage within our supply chain, but we never tested it out. Recent big fact, we don't have time or we never actually took time of it now. Once you do your stress testing, a lot of things will come out. It will give you different mitigating, a lot of scenarios gonna pop out. And that will help you in kind of develop different controls and different, you know, Mitigating risk, like uh, if this happens, this and this is what we need to do to kind of reduce this risk. I would have this residual risk or whatnot. But oftentimes we don't do the stress testing. And we've been having some discussion, there's been a lot of things that have been spoken in different corridors about this stress testing that if we've been stress testing some of the supply chains we have, because to be honest with you, a lot of the supply chains that we have out there have never gone through this kind of rigorous uh, stress. And a lot of them are broken. You know, some are still hanging on, some are like strong, strong, and some are broken. And the reason why is because we never stress test. When you stress test, you know where your vulnerability points are. You correct it, you strengthen it, you do it, tighten it. And, and then you look at different opportunities and how you can, where you can flush ideas to the certain areas and where you can help them uh, support those certain areas that are weak. You know, oftentimes not all the part of the load is gonna be extremely strong. Some are weaker than the other. And you, yours is to make sure that you strengthen those that are weak and then you maintain those that are strong. But this all can be identified during the stress testing. This is quite expensive and very time consuming. But I'll tell you what, the, the cost that is gonna cost your supply chain, the, if you don't do it, it's gonna be far greater than what you do, what the cost is gonna cost you just doing the stress test. Uh, and of course you come up with implementing controls. This is where people, uh, risk is, is very cyclical in nature and very continuous. We have to continue to monitor them because one is done right now, just like balance. I don't know if you see my, balance is nothing, it's not something that is constant. Balance is just not like this. Balance is always like, it's always, it's a very continuous process. It's a very continuous movement. You cannot, you cannot say you have found balance one time and then stick with it, no. Balance is a very continuous movement and you have to continue to maintain that to be able to get balance. The same thing with risk. You have to continue to monitor it, put, put in the tons on the pulse of it to be able to make it more realistic and to make it more uh, more alive, you know. And then, of course, you supervise and you evaluate. You look at different residual uh, residual risk, what you can use in the nearest future, and what has worked, what hasn't worked, and how you can mitigate it. These are things that uh, is expected of us. As imagine everything else you're doing within your supply chain, and then somebody tell you that you're tasked with developing risk uh, supply chain risk uh, management within your organization. You'd be like, "What is this guy smoking?" You know, because it's a very intensive process, but this is what is expected of us. After COVID-19, every supply chain manager is, is, it will be asked to be equipped with this kind of knowledge. When you come to work, they'll be expecting you to be able to develop a risk management program within your organization. And when we're talking about developing risk management, these are the things you have to take into consideration. Uh, and then that's about it. Uh, there's some other stuff that we're gonna talk about question and answer, but these are the things I want us to look into as we, as we address, uh, as we go, as I mean, COVID-19 is pivoting a little bit, uh, depending on uh, what kind of report you believe in uh, from the government or from the doctors, they are all completing ideas, but 
as it now as it states that some some states where you are in the US are coming out of it, some are not in different parts of the world, people are lifting the ban as they say. But at some point in the nearest future, the world is gonna go back to the normal or whatever we define as the new norm. And this is what is gonna be expected of us. Ability to articulate risk management within your supply chain is gonna bring value, enormous value. And I want us to start leaning forward towards it. Uh, and start making sense of it. I'm working on a very robust uh, supply chain risk management course. And it's almost at the end of it. I think we're gonna release it at the end of the month, uh, next month. And if you're interested in it, register for it. It's gonna be mind blowing. I'm gonna have interviews from uh, people that have managed risks differently from their organization and how they've seen risk has changed over the course of time in supply chain over the last 40 years and what they anticipate in the nearest future and what, how we as supply chain managers can pivot and be of value to make sure that we're ahead of this risk. Risk, you got to be ahead of it. There's no other way than to be ahead of it. So all these things are the one I want you to at least kind of provoke different line of thinking within us and hope we can we can come up with viable solution. But I'll let you know when, when the course is completed and we can we can all have, a, you know, it's a, it's a learning process for us. I mean, this before we start we're talking about how can we even get a better product of uh, stress testing or more importantly how to map our supply chain in such a way that is very quite unique and it brings more value to uh, uh, to different organizations without no uh, further you back to you uh, mr Biodo. okay uh thanks so much um i mean this is uh, a lot of information within a very short time that we had but um, you know, I haven't said that. I I want to believe that uh, if you are listening in to this uh, live stream, you would have picked one thing or the other. Um, what I would like from you, because uh, this uh, webinar, it's it's not something that we believe we know all, right? Like we want a situation where you also can you know, provide your own perspectives as a professional in the industry. Uh, whatever has happened, COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, I also happen to, I've actually gotten some information from a professional I had a webinar with uh, sometimes around February or so, or the first week of March. The professional was actually in the food industry, okay, uh, grains. You know, Canada is uh, into grains a lot. A lot of our export is actually grains. Uh, especially in the west, uh, the, the prairies, you know, from Winni uh, Manitoba all the way to Vancouver, right? So we we export a lot of grains to China, and he told me that look, this is what is happening in China right now. <laughs> you know, imagine that that type of information is actually an information that is uh, discrete, like an information that is fed into a system. And this type of information is being garnered from every other data, every other node within a supply chain. Apparently, when you have that information, you are able to make some forecast about what is going to happen to your supply chain eventually. It's, it's only a matter of time. Uh, well, eventually, it, it happened. You know, within a month, uh, I think I'm talking about it's probably first week of March. Now, today, uh, this is April ending. So within, I believe within four weeks, this happened, you know, that this thing hit uh, Manitoba. And before we know what we're talking about here now, um, we're in a shutdown and uh, we're still in, in a shutdown right now. Uh, but my own uh, perspective about this, what I think about is how come, like, are you telling me that there is no one who actually has gotten this information in advance to be able to make a focus about how it's going to impact their supply chain because it pretty much looked like nobody was prepared for this is it possible that nobody had an information at hand that could actually use it to mitigate uh, I, I, this is a ridiculous example i learned the other day that that canada actually burned like one million n95 masks last year just november last year how close could that be? I mean, uh, COVID-19 already was happening in China in November. So how could it be that you have that type of information and you take an action that pretty much put people's lives at, at risk, right? Because that's that's what it is. Yeah, it, so it these is. are the kind of question that I would like us to 
you know, ask. I mean, I mean, uh, they say a problem I've so a uh, problem known is half solved. I would like to really see from your own perspective what are those things that you have seen, you know, that, that you know raises questions. What are those questions that you have? Uh, would like to really appreciate uh, if you could, you know, uh, post those questions. And you know, this is a mastermind we have here. I believe that all of the guys in this webinar are all supply chain professionals, and you can speak to whatever question that any one of us bring bring up. So if you can, um, there is a question and answer uh, tool that you can use, or if you prefer, actually, we actually would prefer that you speak. Like I could give you a, your remote, I can unmute your microphone so that you can speak, and you know, uh, that that really will be will be appreciated, and uh, everybody would get the question and be able to respond uh, by raising up there's a tool actually that we use to raise up your hand and then i'll allow you to speak uh once i see that uh yeah uh that's what i'll do but uh now i will show you the the poll i believe uh only seven out of 11 i think we had 11 people only uh seven out of uh, 11 uh, responded uh, if you haven't responded, I just give you like the next, uh, you know, one minute and, and I will publish uh, the the, uh, the poll. Okay. Yeah, I think we, we have a question here from uh, Remilek Mwobad, you know, how do we implement the controls when most of the product or items comes from China because of price disparity and cheap labor? Um, this is a very contending uh, questions because you're talking about the, one of the known risk is what availability of supply. And, uh, and availability of supply is, I mean, if my knowledge of economics and the part of factors of production uh, has to deal with it, you know. Uh, and and what I advise I've done for a lot of CPOs is the fact that they should tax their supply chain managers to do the, 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 the evaluation, why will it, what's the cost and why should I pivot uh, away from China? Although the, the price disparity is, uh, uh, is there and cheap labor, but in situations like this, whereby despite the price disparity and cheap labor, you still can't get the material. Getting hold of the item is more important now than the price. So I'll always advise if China is still gonna continue or depending on the political risk, uh, you know, inherent of China is fine, but always find alternate source of supply. Because in an, in an event whereby the current issues where we're having right now, that China is actually restricting a lot of shipment outside their country, because they don't know what is going to happen in the second or third wave, then a lot of, and then if anything happened in the second or third wave and the, the whole country is shut down again, it goes your items that fit into your manufacturing and the items. So I will advise as you, part of you know uh, supply risk mitigating strategy is to figure out a way to convince your CPO by articulating a dollar and cent because oftentimes the CPO doesn't see anything unless it is he has the dollar value to it because that's the only thing they understand the impact of the shareholders is the fact that you bring it to them like look yes we can continue to chat but we need to have alternate sources of supply because in, in an event anything happens in China and we cannot defend it Oh, there's nothing we can do because half of some of these problems and some of these risks are handled at the at the high at the highest level, at the national level, strategic level. Then we have to take matters into our own hands and pivot. And one of the things as but one of when you're doing risk management is to always have alternative sources of supply. Though the, the price is different and whatnot, and it might be changing price for your consumer, that's something you're gonna eat up. But if your product is that good they will understand and they will deal with it because they rather have it than they rather have it expensive than not to have it at all. So oftentimes we all, a lot of us don't have any alternate source of supply. We just China, 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 and China, you know? And not only China, even Southeast Asia, and other country, we have to have two or three other sources of supply that we can always activate at any given time. I hope I have answered your question, uh, Remilek, more bad enough. So I'm still waiting on the question from the, the guys in the webinar. Uh, well, you need to use a tool to raise your hand and I can then unmute you so that you can speak or you can put in your question in the chat box. 
So while we are waiting on the other guys to ask their question, this is the the, the result for the poll that uh, you know that we we okay. had uh, eight out of out of eleven people okay. who have uh, responded. Can you can you send it? Is there a way you can send it to me or by email? I can. Yeah, I definitely I will send it. But you can see it right now, right? Like you can see it. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So uh, basically the the attributes that uh, most people have uh, identified as um, the attributes of a linear supply chain is it sequential uh, and then is it static yeah and which uh, apparently if it is static then it is not supply chain okay <laughs> that that is the way I see it. If it's static, then it is it is not supply chain. I know we had some discussion at some point where we actually said that uh, some of the theories that it's been taught in school nowadays in terms of supply chain is pretty much obsolete, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, think about uh, Michael Potter's um, value chain, supply mm -hmm. value chain. Uh, it is is it is uh, sequential, like it's from this node to this node to this node mm -hmm. that way. Um, and then there is not even connected. That's the other thing when you look at that model, you know. Uh, so that is what we're still working with. I mean, um, yeah, we, we, we now we know that there's a supply network, uh, the supply chain network, which actually that's the reality uh, of what we are working, what we are working with today. Uh, as you can see, the second question here says it's dynamic. Well, that, that is the supply chain uh, that I know, that I worked in. But unfortunately, like uh, you did say that at the bio earlier, that it appears that there is a conflict between uh, what exists as the operating supply chain model and the tools that we are actually working with in most organization is based on the linear supply chain model. When you have this type of situation, what you actually have is inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, again, okay, <laughs> saying that again, uh, it, it appears that some of the key performance indicators that we're working with in supply chain also has to change because mm -hmm. Uh, look at me, for example, in procurement, uh, you know, depending on the environment where you work, uh, if you worked in oil and gas, probably the type of key performance indicator might be different. They might not be focused on uh, price or cost savings. They might be focused on maybe risk management, actually, because it's an high risk area. So uh, they might be focused on speed. You know, they need to get things done. They need to get it done now. Um, they, are, they are not focused on compliance, apparently. Okay, so it's different for each uh, organization, uh, but the, the the mere fact that if we are working with a linear supply chain model, uh, and then we we have, have some kind of key performance indicators that also sort of aligns with a linear supply chain model, then automatically we have a, a struggle there because then we're not working. Uh, with, with dynamic a dynamic model that could actually uh, do some some very proactive uh, uh, optimization uh, just to, to use that language uh, in a situation where you, you have a supply chain network that is very active and proactive and uh, my my uh, you know my thought process is we have uh, the technology to make that happen as a matter of fact I think that there's a technology somewhere that already implements this. Anything that you can imagine, it's done already. Somebody already did it. But uh, in terms of our network, our supply chain uh, professional network, I, I don't know. I haven't really had any information like, like you guys that are um, on this webinar. This is one of the reasons why we have our group, the Supply Jobs Canada group. Yeah, maybe you, you have those type of information. Yeah, please uh, go ahead and share with us if you know of a tool that uh, actually has been uh, developed and is in use, and you already are, you know, have access to those type of tools. Yeah, go ahead and share uh, the, the information with us so that we could also have that knowledge and share that information with people in our group that look, 
there's a particular tool but I, as far as i know i haven't seen those tools um in terms of the supply chain uh social graph yeah that is that is fantastic actually i i, I happen to be working on something like that but not specifically to address risk management and that's a, the, the beauty of a, a supply chain social graph because um once you is an infrastructure basically that's what it is because once you have that um then it is then scalable to address any issue that you might have in your supply chain be it a risk issue uh, be it maybe price sensitivity or you know something of that nature you could, you could pretty much apply to any uh objective that you have in your supply chain so for me I believe supply chain social graph is very, very critical to solving a lot of this problem, uh, specifically addressing the uh, the issue of, uh, uh, you know, the dynamic uh, supply chain model that we think we should have right now instead of the linear one. So that, that's my own thought, but uh, let me see. Uh, I think Johnny Lu has a comment here. It may be less difficult to perform stress tests on SC on unknown costs, okay? Known cost is what he says here. What about unknown and unexpected so, situations, so, such as a major war breaks out or financial market uh, collapse? So I, I, there are two questions. Actually, there are three questions there. There's one on question and answer, and there's one from uh, Remilek Mobadina and Joe Lu. So I'll, I'll just take it one by one. So with Remilek, which I asked first, is that for flexibility and technology advancement, I think it's it's possible to change from linear to network chain within the organization. What is your take? Yes, it is, but it has to have everything that goes on within the organization, including the supply chain framework, has to be in sync with what your management is doing. So if the management is still in the uh, archaic era, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to implement. Yes, there are a lot of technologies. It's easier to switch into that network. Yes, it is, but it is expensive as well and is yet and is asked to be something that the the management is comfortable doing and that's the most important thing because none of this thing is going to be able it's going to it's going to happen if management is not has not blessed off on it or willing to go that route with them maybe they said they just don't see it and oftentimes uh what most supply chain managers do is to kind of be their head bang their head against the wall and to convince the management that this is the uh the next frontier this is the best way and this is the uh uh, you know, next thing to do, or the best thing to do for the organization. Now, uh, talking about uh, Johnny Lou, it may be less difficult to perform stress tests on supply chain unknown cores. Uh, what, uh, what about unknown and unexpected situations such as war breakout on financial crisis and collapse? Now, uh, oftentimes, this, uh, this I'll put it to you, Johnny Lou, oftentimes, I completely understand, yes, it is less difficult to perform stress tests on a known risk, then unknown risk is, is hard because you don't know where it's coming from. But another thing that where we as supply chain managers needs to, needs to be, be very proactive about it and very, very intuitive in nature. Unknown cause that things that we, we think we don't know, it just happened. But oftentimes these things are actually percolate over time. It's just the symptoms that we see that we see that, oh, this just happened. Often, oftentimes, this has been happening in the background. We just don't see it or put one or two together. For example, I was sharing with him, prior to Donald Trump being elected as the president of the United States, uh, the 43rd president of the United States, he made some very bold campaign statement during his campaign. People are like, this guy is off the rails. He doesn't know exactly what he's talking about. But some companies actually took what he said as a possibly as a possible outcome and they actually plan their supply chain just in case this guy got elected we cannot be found with our pants now we have to be proactive and they actually pivoted so when this issue of china trade war started they were already there they were already they've already found different suppliers that apart from china so when the rest of the world was actually trying to find that bearing these guys already gone you know to them, the fact of the matter is they've already seen it. They were able to piece all those things together. Uh, the same thing with war. I mean, war just doesn't start in the day. This is 
background, ability to actually look at those populations and okay, if this thing, worst case scenario, if this thing continues to like this, it's gonna be, you know, full all out war. And what do I need to do? I need to figure out a way that my supply chain is protected. Oftentimes, with supply chain managers, we're not given that much uh, credit or we're not given that much power to go deeper, to make decisions by looking at finite details of data that are out there and make decisions. Okay, if this thing continues this way, let's look at different and uh, permit different scenarios that can come out of it. So to your question, uh, Johnny Lou, some of these things can be mitigated especially the war and major war by financial markets. Yes, there are a lot of indicators out there that people will put together as like, okay, this is not the last time this thing looks like this, we had a major issue in the financial market. So let's start making, the same thing can be done in supply chain, but just let's say that we weren't given the opportunity to put all those uh, numbers together that we actually go out on. Well, there's nothing actually we can do, but the one thing we can only do during those time is look at the real data. And as it, data has started to come in and we kind of started forming our own intuitive uh, decision and make adjustment as necessary. I hope I've answered those questions. And then there is one here uh, from Ibrahim. How, how to evaluate resources required to mitigate risk? How much is acceptable? This is all predetermined, Ibrahim, from the get-go. And these all boils down to the risk culture within the organization. What kind of resources and all these things are gonna be a lot. It's not something that you just make up along the line. As, it, as an organization determines to toe the line of risk management within the, uh, within the supply chain, how to evaluate the kind of resources, what kind of resources is gonna be allocated to it and how much is gonna be allocated to it and what is acceptable and what is not, is gonna be all predetermined. So ahead of time, and it's all determined on the market position of the organization and how much aggressive they wanna be as well. So all these things feeds into supply chain and supply chain make the best out of it when assessing the, those kind of risk. I hope I've answered those questions. Uh, so I guess uh, how to evaluate the resources required. Yeah, that's what I just answered. Mitigate risk and then how much is acceptable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ibrahim, I hope you got the answer there. Um, you can just confirm by typing in yes and uh, we'll, we'll move on. Hello? Yes. Okay. So uh, how do we analyze it, the stress testing on multiple suppliers? That's from uh, Remilego. Okay, so analyzing multiple suppliers, different criteria, different supplier development, uh, you, uh, depending on the kind of critical criticality they are involved in. If these guys are hardly as obvious, material or as adios uh, items, it's gonna be completely different from somebody that has something that has to do with just natural or rare metal. So each particular uh, suppliers, uh, and the stress testing mostly, like I said earlier, is not for all the suppliers. It's only for critical suppliers. And oftentimes, maybe, let's say you have about 5,000 items and all come from different, different suppliers. Uh, and only 20 items are critical in there. Those 20 items are the one you're going to be contained about because all other supply, all other items can be substituted for and can be sourced somewhere else. But these other 20 suppliers, they're like very critical to you, and you have to guard them like you guard them you know, like your last meal, you know. So uh, and depending on the, the the different parameters, so oftentimes some because if they're similar then you can actually bundle your supplier at one point, but they, they can be similar. So the way you kind of assess them is differently. And the way each of them is gonna to react to it is different, depending on which area of the world they are and depending on what kind of social network. Because we're talking about stress testing the very you know, social environment. You don't even know if some of them in a developing economy, they have different framework from a, a westernized, well-developed framework. So all the, the all different parameters and what your risk appetite for each and every one of them is different. What you're allowing, what I'm gonna, I'm going to allow for a, a, a supply out of France. It's going to be different from out of the supply out of Djibouti. Absolutely yeah. different. So that, that reminds me, uh, just uh, to jump in, and that reminds me of uh, the the topic of uh, indexing yes. uh, the the risk uh, in in our supply chains, which is I think it, it ties into what you are talking about there. You know, because you, you have limited resources, you can't chase down every other uh, supplier. 
uh, or every other risk event or probable risk event. You know, that, that's it. That's it. You know, the the, uh, the dynamics of this thing. And you know what? Maybe a probable event uh, last week, you know, might actually be an active one, you know, this week. You know, just as the way we had, um, yeah. you know, this, this COVID-19 thing. I, I'm, pro I'm sure it's on some people's radar. There's no way it is not there has on to be, people's radar. Especially when you have uh, PPE that was normal, all of a sudden the thing starts skyrocketing like weeks and weeks and weeks. And if you look at the way the world is being played in a global economy, if it's already in Wuhan, look at flight pattern from Wuhan to other part of the world. Okay, if it's already in Wuhan, definitely, if we continue to look at the map, of, definitely some part of the world is going to get it, you know? It's just a matter of time. And how do we, you know, those, those things, could, like I said, a lot of slow reaction, happened. A lot of people just nonchalant attitude happened. And some of them could have been mitigated absolutely. And some of them maybe wouldn't have been up absolute as well as but one we know right now is the fact that the information that we have, we just have to act on it because this their real time. Okay. So I, I hope that answered the question. But um so that question um, from Nepal. You have an, another question? Yes. Uh, how do we analyze the stress testing? Oh, oh, uh, that's the one you just answered now. So uh, maybe she could confirm if uh, we've answered uh, the uh, the the question. Uh, definitely, there, there will be a, a follow up to this because, uh, like we know already, supply chain is not going to be normal uh, again. Uh, we are already under the radar. Um, I mean, you know what happened in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, BC, okay? So uh, BEC actually decided to take over uh, the supply chain. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember right now if it's for the food supply chain or the medical supply chain, they, they, they intervened basically. So that just tells you uh, that supply chain is now under the radar of the government because they, uh, they believe that they could have done things better. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and, and you know, um, why, why I'm, I'm laughing right there is what happened with Canada, uh, you know, when they flew a plane to China uh, and they came back empty. Okay. So what, what came to my mind is um, buyer beware. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the first thing that we learned, you know, in supply chain that uh, regardless of what promises has been made to you, you just have to make sure that you do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, our premier in Manitoba saying that, yeah, we were the first, uh, you know, uh, government to place an order for, you know, 20 million, 20, 20 million or whatever, uh, PPEs and stuff like that, you know. And uh, guess what? I, I'm just my guess. One of the planes that went out, you know, probably was Manitoba plane. It also came back empty with uh, the federal one. So it's easy to say that we're not doing it right or supply chain doesn't get it. But how easy it is for the government to actually intervene in the supply chain profession, you know, which is basically something that started, uh, well, maybe the traditional supply chain started off with the military and all that, but then the modern supply chain, for me, the model for modern supply chain is Walmart, which is in the private sector. How, how cool a, a government or a, a regulator step into that without causing chaos. I'm just telling you to prepare for what is going to happen to supply chain, basically is what I'm saying. Uh, the, the fact that now there's a disruption that is happen, happening to supply chain uh, is what we have to prepare for. Um, like I said, there's a negative side of it. There is a positive side of it. Um, but, you know, maybe this will be a question to you because I, these are something I, some things I also would like us to take away from this discussion that we also look at the positive side. So what do you think in terms of the disruption, especially coming from the government side where uh, Toronto decided to take over the food supply chain? Now, this is another risk. This is a regulatory risk we're talking about right here. Um, there is a BC decided to take over the, you know, maybe medical or even the entire supply chain. I don't, I, I didn't follow through with what happened eventually with that. Maybe they saw that, oh, this is too big for them. They kind of dropped the idea. I don't know because I haven't heard anything since I saw that in the newspaper. 
So in terms of regulated risk, um, how, how does this pan out? Also, um, you could also talk about the, the trade um, agreement between United States and, and Canada, how the whole thing, these dynamics, you know, was playing out. Is it, was it further adding to the problem or, you know, is there a way we need to prepare for this? Because this is what I'm saying with supply chain going forward. We're now being sensitive even to a different type of risk now after this COVID-19. You would see a situation where we're just paranoid going forward. Actually, paranoia is all over the, the world right now. Okay. So how, how do we, uh, what do you think about this? How do we as supply chain prepare for this? Maybe in terms of our career development or maybe in terms of how we navigate supply chain uh, profession going forward? So now, as you can see, the what we call the, the risk chain uh, this is where one risk triggers another risk, triggers another risk. So one risk now, actually, the saying is no risk actually occurs in a vacuum. That's another risk is going to trigger on the whole process. So this has particularly has triggered a lot of political and regulatory risk. Uh, and some of them are, is it temporary or permanent? Those are the things. Are they going to take it over permanently? Or temporary. If it's temporary, it's just a, it's just something you have to manage for a time being. But if it is permanent, then it changes the whole dynamics of things. So you have to kind of restructure your whole supply chain framework because now something that used to be something that you can manage as a risk is now part of your whole framework now. And those are the things that is this going to be a continued effort by the government? Like, look, if something doesn't go the way they like it, they're going to take it over. And that is what you need to be, because this is the thing, when it comes to the issue of government, it's supposed to be something that you shouldn't be considered as a risk. It's supposed to be like certainty. You know, risk is something that, like I said earlier, is when you have this high level of uncertainty. So with this birth, the idea of at any given time, is any of my supply chains going to be inter interrupted by the government because they just don't like the way the, the things are looking. And those are the things we have to be very cognizant of as the thing happens. And you have to advise, look, at any given time, the government can intervene in an interception of anything. And that provides a lot of risks that we have to kind of mitigate and prepare for. I kind of, uh, I don't know how you kind of, um, let me put it this way, how one can actually uh, contain those kind of uh, risk because governmental risks are very, very, they're very strange. Actually, of all the risks out there, political and governmental risks are very, very strange because until you have a change of government or you have to lobby and all those kind of things, those risks don't really go away. And they can actually add additional uh, stuff to you. And if you're a manufacturer, they probably have additional days or weeks. You know, if you're in a project, probably had additional days or weeks. And that's going to affect your time, your cost, and your performance, and your schedule, yeah. you know, all those things. So those are the things, the, the second and third order effect of some of these risks. And one has to just adjust it. But the thing is always boiled down is it going to be temporal or is it going to be yeah, permanent? Yeah, yeah. And that now, with the issue of the, the, uh, the China, I mean, the, the NAFTA shredding. NAFTA has always been the, the, the bedrock of the North American trade. It's very, very solid. And people, if everything that's going on between all those three countries, people do not need any uncertainty. So when these whole things happen, they created so much havoc with steel issue, steel prices on the rise of steel, movement of goods and services. Like at some point during this whole trade with uh, you know, NAFTA and everything came to question during when Donald Trump intervened in you know, 3M, you know, manufacturing of regulators yeah. and movement of food across Canadian borders, all these things are always going to come up. But question is, uh, is it going to impair? How many days is it going to impair? You know, if it's going to be permanent, then you need to know ahead of time. If it's going to be temporary, that is where the friction point is always. Because you never know when temporary is just going to be, you know, off or it's going to be permanent. So yeah. the thing I always advise supply chain managers is the, the flexibility that comes with it. Because most importantly is how you communicate this thing to your customers and to your suppliers alike. Because those are where the risk is going to be highly tense, is at the receiving end of it. You as the middleman, as a supply chain manager, is able to make sure that, okay, this is how much is going to affect my upstream and my downstream. How can I manage it in such a way that it's always going to be free flow? Because if those regulations or whatever intervention from the government causes additional money, we need to know ahead of time. We need to know how we're going to spread it. We need to know who's going to be you know, responsible for what. You know, And all those things is where mostly the friction point is. If government delays this thing extra two weeks, who's going to eat up those costs? There's a cost to the driver staying at the border of 
uh, between Canada and the U.S. for two is who going to pay for the guy? You know, all those things, you know, all, they, there's always a cost to it. And there's always on the superficial side, on the back end as well, there's always a cost to, you know, bringing people to come do to manufacture when there's no material on hand because it's being held at the, at the border and all those kind of things. So how did they, there's this uh, second I thought is about planning. So ahead of it, normally, I mean, a step for uh, extracting circumstances like we have, normally government always give timelines, you know, before they intervene, like these days where we're going on in two weeks time, we're going to start this. That will give time for people to adjust. And that's a great thing about governmental and political risk. They always give you some timeline to adjust, to make your decision. Oftentimes, the rest of the risks are not there. They just happen like that, you know? So that's, the, that's a great, I mean, that's always the silver lining in there. Um, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, yeah, you answered it, but the more you talk about it, the more I also see uh, a lot of things that are gonna happen after uh, this COVID-19. I mean, you think about it, Japan is uh, trying to move all their, you know, uh, manufacturers out of China, that is going to impact some supply chain here in Canada. I hope somebody yeah. is thinking about how that is going to impact their supply chain. Uh, so, um, you know, so that uh, six months down the road or one year down the road, somebody don't think, it's not saying that, oh, I didn't know that's going to happen. Yeah, like you said, when Donald Trump went on his campaign saying that he's going to do, he's going to trash NAFTA, yeah, mm -hmm. some, some people were already working on that, you know, okay, how is exactly. it going to affect our supply chain? I think exactly. in the same manner, uh, we need to be looking at how uh, these responses from all these uh, uh, governments in China, uh, pulling out their 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 nationals from, from China is going to affect uh, the supply chain it's, for it's sure. Absolutely, exactly. If you, if China, if that particular supplier is not only supplying the Japanese, or it's only supplying other countries. But now you have two or three countries that are already withdrawn. That makes not those guys always, you know, manufacturing volumes. But the volume has decreased. Though so that happens to your unit price of whatever yeah. you get out of there as well. So it's gonna everyone is gonna get out. I mean, you know, you can't fight in the morning without getting stained. So it's yeah. very, uh, and those are the things. There's no action that, especially the network supply chain. There's no action that is done in vacuum. Once one is done, it's gonna affect the other. It's gonna affect the uh, other. And, Whatever out this whole thing between the U.S. and this conflict, this cold war tactics between the U.S. and China is going to resolve. The rest of the world is going to feel the heat, and they, they are actually feeling the heat at the moment. So, uh, and we'll continue like that until the new administration happens in 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 June and in 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 November, if there is any new administration, and how that one is going to tackle whatever is already existing between China and the U.S. But let let, let it be known that U.S. and China have always been adversary forget whatever is going on, whatever they tell the world. But the national security, there are few countries that are on the adversary list of the United States, and China is number one. Has always been number one for the last couple of years. So mm -hmm. uh, they fight economic warfare. They don't fight military warfare, but they fight economic warfare. So if you have that one at the back of your mind, that regardless of whatever is going on, U.S. will always seek their own best interest in China. And that will never sit well with China. So this whole back and forth thing will continue to go for a long time. We have at least one more question here. Okay, uh, I just were talking about that. I remember the uh, the cyber warfare as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yes, when we that's another into... risk in itself. And we also have to take into consideration as a lot of people are moving because of COVID nineteen. A lot of the digital economy has expanded. A lot of people are online now. is a is a prime time for cyber the cyber warfare. I mean, it is people are getting attacked. Look at Zoom. Everything that's going on in the world. Do you think people? Some normal people are out there to be like, you know what, the only thing that is going on for the world, let's just maintain it. But definitely some people are actually attacking. So there is nothing that is that is absolute in this world as we know it. As we continue to unleash and move to digital world, so is a lot of issues with the digital world as well. Data protection, how to protect your data, because now data is going to be how you, now you gain your competitive edge in your industry. And that data is stolen from you. You might as well just pack and close your doors. You know, and those become even new, newer dimensions of the risk exactly. management now. Right? Exactly. Now we need uh, to put ABC, into consideration. ABC, okay. ABC inventory control management. Uh, ABC inventory control management used in controlling the inventory. Now the COVID nineteen occurred. Is it necessary to overstock on the stock the critical items to avoid such pandemic? Or will it forecasting works with what mitigation strategy process should be? 
in place. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, we've talked about just-in-time inventory has gone yeah. out. So, I mean, we've been using just-in-time since the onset of the 90s or, uh, you know, uh, I think it was right after Jack Welsh, uh, the old thing with yes. G and whatnot. Now, nobody actually, uh, even Amazon, except for those guys that do, nobody actually carries inventory no more because the cost of it, inventory holding cost is, uh, is can be high, especially in the service economy, whereby you have to, the, the real estate in, in most of this Western world is high. You know, people to manage the warehouse is high. Just you pay them, what, $17 an hour. I mean, this thing, there's a cost issue with it. So ability to get this thing within a day or two is, is what most logistic companies are working on, 24 mm -hmm. hours delivery, or even within an hour's delivery. Now, I believe in agile supply chain. Is uh, supply chain has to be agile, especially in this kind of uh, conditions. We have to have agile supply chain, and oftentimes, regardless of what is going on in the world, regardless of whatever is going on in the world, we every one of us will always embrace, uh, you know, you know, less inventory and whatnot. But you always have to, you always have to have rainy days, just in case anything happens within your supply chain. You always have to have some kind of inventory of free requirements to stop gap, whatever is necessary. Now, this has to be blessed over the strategic level. You see that how many months is stop gap? Three months, six months, or whatnot. And you build those costs into your supply chain cost overall cost. You know, uh, just in time is sweet and great, but if China closes this door one day and say, we're not doing anything, you depict all your stuff before you pivot to get another verify and certify another supply in another country, look at their processes, it may take time especially in countries that don't have framework, then you have to wait for God knows two, three months to get something done. You have to get going. Oftentimes, certifying and getting a new supply is not a very, it's not like a flip of switch kind of process. It takes months yeah. looking at investigating into there because it takes, there's another part we call brand and reputational risk. If you don't get the right supplier, it affects yeah. your brand and reputation. And that will, that will ruin any company, any organization faster than COVID-19, you know? So, all these things are very so it is it is quite and this has to be done at the strategic level and look if if all things happen if all hell broke loose what how can we are we doing six months that we didn't regardless of what is going on can we pivot in six months and get a new supplier that is we align with culturally and processly you know is there a way good and then keep those material i'm always an advocate of it people don't like it it's a cost issue but regardless you build those costs in as part of your permanent That's, uh, buffer, like, buffer stock, right? Buffer stock, exactly. Uh, it will work, but some people don't like the idea. They believe the old world is so seamless and whatnot, but it might yeah. not even be China. It might be some <laughs> strike action in the port of Los Angeles that caused yeah. overload. And I mean, there's so much that can happen. I mean, you don't even, there's a tsunami that can happen. There's often that you give no prior warning that can destroy all kinds of things, you know. Straight, straight of Malacca in Singapore, my shutdown due to some earthquake and then no supply comes out of China. And then what yeah. happens? So all these things can happen in any given time. It's always good, like I, I'm a proponent of humanitarian supply chain, whereby certain stocks are gonna be at every part of the world because by the time, nobody has the time to be pivoting. They just go to your warehouse, pick those stuff up and you know, start your relief system. That's my own, I've always advised my clients that way because um, as only way to kind of, uh, kind of mitigate this, so at the beginning, as you start this supply chain journey and risk mitigation, all these things have to be factored in. At the, and, your, and your organization at the managerial level must be comfortable that this is what we are willing to do. Three months, six months, four months, that's it. That's all the stocks we have to produce without losing any, anything after that we lost, you know? So mm -hmm. those kind of things have to be done prior to. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that that like you were talking about risk management strategies. This all yeah. has to go into the formulation of the risk management strategy. Exactly. exactly. Uh, the indexing as well, because if you properly index uh, a risk event or even a supplier risk, uh, then there is a potential that you are proactive uh, with uh, whatever risk event happens, either with that supplier or with that material or you know with any other node. In your supply chain and this is the reason why like i said earlier that the supply network social graph is really uh, is, mm -hmm. is is something that we cannot do without in this the reality of the new the the new uh, 
supply chain model. You know, it's really nothing. It's something we cannot do without because I, I can imagine that uh, prior to this time, you know, the way people manage risk is so linear that they are not able to figure out all the permutations, you know, that needs to happen with down to the second, the third tier, even to the last tier of their supply chain. And this is the reality that we're facing currently with uh, the, the linear supply chain model. And the reason why we are, we're not well prepared for the, the model of disruption, <laughs> which is the COVID-19 that happened. Yes. Uh, yeah, but it, it, it's been interesting so far. Really, I really appreciate your uh, contribution. I'm not sure if we have any question, uh, no more at this point. Uh, we've actually spent the 90 minutes. Uh, we, you know, top the 90 minutes for this webinar. Uh, well, I'm I'm looking forward to a follow up actually to look at the root cause. Okay, because we're talking about COVID-19 right now, but we were saying that is actually the model of our supply chain that is the root cause. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I think it's something we need to look at the the, the design of our supply chain uh, to look at a different model and actually see how this has uh, contributed to what we are right now because eventually we're gonna have other type of uh, disruptions. Um, at that point, we're not gonna be talking about COVID-19 anymore. We'll be like, okay, so what is going on here? We'll still, ball, we'll still, we'll still go back to the supply chain model that we're saying is the root exactly. cause. So uh, we will need to uh, still uh, do a follow-up with you on uh, the design uh, of the supply chain models and see what uh, we, we can come up with uh, at that point. But for now, I don't see any questions. Really appreciate the time. I strongly uh, encourage the guys who are online to reach out. Uh, well, maybe if I have a link to your course, I could put it in a follow-up message to those who okay. are in attendance uh, mm -hmm. so that if they are interested in the course, uh, it's something that can enroll into. And we'll see how we could also work together uh, to collaborate exactly. on, on this uh, going forward. Definitely. Uh, Definitely. And a lot of these are two pieces of what is going to be coming up uh, for the course. And I'm, I'm really expecting, I think we're going to look at risk supply chain risk management in a new dimension. Uh, right, we, very awesome. So thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And for everyone that has a question, I hope I've been able to impact uh, one way or the other. And uh, some of those questions are quite provoking as well. And I love it. I love it. It gives a new line of thinking. As we answer some of those questions, some new things have started popping up. And uh, I really do appreciate you all for spending your evening and making it work. And uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll follow up uh, soon after. Okay. Bye for now. Yeah.